Hey everybody, today will probably be one of my more unstructured rambles, although you did like the editing that I did in my last video a lot, so more of that's coming. It was a little bit too much work, so I'll probably uh, be hiring an editor. Uh, who knows, maybe this one will go through the ringer, so you might be seeing an unstructured ramble or an edited one. It remains to be seen. Anyways, some people asked about my camera, lighting, and that sort of thing, so I just want to do a little bit of housekeeping first. Yes, I got a new camera. It is the uh, Razer Ultra 4K something or other. Um, so it's basically an SLR, but webcam format. I mean, it's literally the size of your fist and I got some better lighting and a new microphone. So I should be coming through loud and clear. It did take a little while to, to finesse the settings. Anyways, straight on into the topics of today. So I've got two primary things that I want to cover today. Number one is OpenAI's kind of latest news. Uh, Sam Altman talked about uh, GPT-5, GPT-6 is going to be coming sooner. He mentioned that they are chip constrained or compute constrained, meaning that they can't roll out new models just yet, even though they have better models. So I want to talk about what I think is going on there. And then the other big thing is the hype cycle ending or the bubble bursting. So there's lots and lots of people talking about an AI bubble. Now, Sam Altman himself, I think, is uh, kind of the progenitor of this current wave of AI bubble anxiety, and I'm, I'm here to provide a little bit of nuance. Um, so we'll get it, we'll get into all of this, and I'll unpack it bit by bit, and then I'll provide a synthesis at the end, kind of where I see all this going. So from the top, OpenAI is holding out some models on us. So Sam Altman has previously said that they can't roll out their best models because they're too big and too compute expensive, but they do have better stuff. Now, some people are probably going to uh, immediately panic and say, see, they're going to keep ASI from us. They're going to keep AGI from us. And it's a temporary thing. So first and foremost, the entire industry is working on producing more and more chips. Uh, Google is scaling up TPUs. NVIDIA is scaling up their GPUs. The Intel and other entrants are coming into the marketplace. Uh, so this is this is what markets do is when there's a when there's a new gold rush the first movers obviously profit the most that's why Nvidia stock is st is sky high uh, not investment advice by the way so what this means is that you know compute constrained energy constrained data constrained we've been talking about this for a couple of years we know what the primary inputs are to new AI models now one thing that that uh, I think some people are confused about is just because a company is compute constrained does not mean they cannot train new models. The training runs, yes, they are expensive. Sam Altman talked about how they would be profitable if it wasn't for the training runs. Uh, I think they're going to be a little bit more conservative about their training runs. But the compute constraint is more about inference time. It's about how many users can they serve. And when you have, as OpenAI does, 700 million daily active users, uh, you need to be able to scale that. Uh, and so every percentage of efficiency matters. And so this leads to uh, my second point about OpenAI being uh, chip constrained and holding back their best models is distillation. So I don't know what the exact numbers are, but GPT-5 is not much bigger than you know, 03 and 01 and, and their, their latest generation of models. And you might say, well, how is it that much smarter if it's not that much bigger, because don't you have to scale parameter count? Yes, but. So here's what I think OpenAI is settling on. Here's their new strategy. What their strategy was up until now was release a big fat frontier model and then use that frontier model to train the next generation of model. And then you scale up algorithms and data and compute and parameter count. I think what they're doing, though, is they're skipping that releasing the big giant fat frontier model to the public, and they're just using it for internal training. And this is the process called distillation, where you have a, a, a frontier model or a big, big giant model that is inefficient, but it's really big, high parameter count, and you have it be the training source for the next uh, generation of models. This is called distillation, and the product of distillation tends to be Smaller, faster, more efficient, but also smarter. So they said, well, rather than burning all of our, our all of our OPEX on inference time compute for these big, fat, efficient models, what if we just go ahead and train the, the Frontier model and then release a smaller, more efficient, faster, smarter model that's cheaper for us to run, and it's going to be a better UX experience for anyone, for everyone anyways. So this is what I think that they're doing. And... 
I think that this is probably why it took so long for GPT-5 to come out, because OpenAI went down a few rabbit holes. They released GPT-4.1 Codex. They released GPT-4.5. They did some experiments. But in the meantime, they said these are not differentiable enough to really justify another model run. Now, Sam has said that they're going to release GPT-6 sooner, you know, over a shorter time horizon, than it took them to release GPT-5. So basically what this looks like to me from the outside is this company is maturing their, their product strategy. Because at this point, it is a product. When you have a billion users and 700 million daily active users, you are mainstream. And so what they learned from the GPT-5 rollout is do not mess with the with your golden goose that's laying that's laying the eggs, right? You you don't you don't sacrifice the uh, what's it called the the not the the golden calf. Anyways, I messed that that metaphor up. You get the idea. Is they had something really good with GPT 4.0, and they didn't really understand how much a huge portion of their customer base really really wanted that particular flavor of model. So they said. We can deliver more of that. So that's why they said they made the product decision GPT-6 will come sooner because they've got, you know, one of the things that, that OpenAI has internally, they've got the top coding model in the world, according to them. They've got the top math model in the world, according to them. So what they're going to do is they're going to use these very expensive frontier models to train GPT-6 along with, you know, whatever else is they've got cooking up internally. Because I'm not saying that they're getting away from synthetic data. I suspect that there will there there may come a day when one model just trains the next model and that's all there is to it and you you add in some some temporal data so like you know training data cutoff is 2024 or 2025 so you'll add some contextual data but I suspect we might get to the point and uh, you know this is this is a prediction and I know that predictions are dangerous but let me put it this way I would not be surprised if in a couple years it's just one generation of model training the next, and you really don't even need that much data. Uh, I might live to regret those words, but here we are. Uh, I've said a lot of things that didn't pan out, but that's part of predicting the future is actually really hard. <laughs> so please forgive me if I make mistakes. Um, anyways, got lost on a tangent. So GPT-6 is coming faster. They're focusing on memory. These are all the reasons that I think that they're going in this direction. Uh, so... Then the, the other side of that is, is the hype cycle truly well and truly over um, is, is the bubble bursting. So there's a few things. It, it's really hard to characterize an entire paradigm shift and put it in such black and white terms. So let me break it down into some, into some subcategories of what I kind of see going on. So first and foremost, we're moving from blue ocean strategy to red ocean strategy. So blue ocean means... The water is clean, you can go anywhere, you can go on fishing expeditions, you can go exploring to the horizon. But then, once the market starts to get crowded, there's blood in the water. And so that means the, the blood in the water happened when Meta really went hog wild poaching AI talent from literally everyone else. Um, and then, you know, the, the poaching was too, too uh, bi-directional, by the way. So everyone is poaching talent from everyone else. If you're a high caliber uh, LLM engineer or scientist in Silicon Valley right now, you are making absolute bank. So good for you. We're all jealous and envious, so on and so forth. But your job is going to be limited because the next generation of models is going to be smarter than you and will probably have you get fired too. Who knows? Um, you know, may maybe that's just a little bit of envy talking. Uh, but moving on, when you move from blue ocean, meaning that you can do whatever you want because you're a first mover, which that's the position that OpenAI enjoyed for the last, I mean, it's basically since ChatGPT Chat GPT launched. But now you've got Meta entering, you've got uh, Google with Gemini, and these are, these are pretty close competitors. I know a lot of people say Grok is close, but when you look at some of the, some of the, some of the benchmarks, Grok is actually decreasing in quality. It's becoming less aligned to human values over time. Um, and the user base knows that. There's a reason that Grok only has 1% of the market share that ChatGPT does. They are not compute constrained. I guarantee you, if you look in, in, in XAI's data centers, those machines are idling <laughs> right now because they have six to seven million daily active users. Now, yes, you might have seen on the App Store or Elon Musk tweeting, look, we're number one in the App Store or number six in the App Store. Yes, they probably had a surge of downloads, 
But keep in mind that everyone already had ChatGPT downloaded and everyone already had Gemini downloaded. And just because you download an app doesn't mean you use it. I have Grok installed on my phone. I almost never use it. I prefer ChatGPT and Perplexity uh, and even Gemini before I use Grok. Grok is great for searching Twitter. That's about it. And even then, it's not really going to give you an honest appraisal of what's happening on Twitter. As an experiment, I asked Grok about negative feedback about Grok, and it very clearly cherry-picked the good stuff. Um, I, even though I specifically asked for negative feedback, what is what is the negative feedback about Grok? And it's like, actually, you know, people are very happy with Grok. And I'm like, that's BS. Don't jerk me around like that. So it's time to compete on UX and user base. That's kind of the whole point here is that as the as you move to Red Ocean, it's going to the competition is going to be a little bit stiffer. So what does that mean? One of the things that I think OpenAI realized with uh, the release of GPT-5 is that we are past the intelligence optimum for many users. So the intelligence optimum is a concept that I've been talking about for a couple of years. I've mentioned it in a couple of videos and a couple of blog posts, but basically it is the threshold beyond which there is marginal utility gains to having a smarter model. Now, for many users, the intelligence optimum has been passed. They were perfectly happy with GPT-4.0. If you make it better at math, better at science, better at chemistry, Many of those users won't care. They're not using it for coding. They're not using it for frontier research. They're using it for a friend, a companion, someone to rant to, someone to just riff with, about life with. So at that point, you don't need to spend a lot of money making the model smarter. Where you really need to put that money is making it uh, better UX, which is memory. So that's why I think uh, OpenAI is talking about GPT-6 is gonna have better memory and personalization and you need to make it cheaper to run on inference time. Uh, so the cheaper and faster it is, they, they have a very, very powerful cost incentive because every token, they're, they're paying for every token. So if they can get it to the point where it's running on commodity hardware, uh, you know, cheaper GPUs uh, or, or other, you know, even gen general purpose uh, hardware, maybe not even GPUs eventually because Intel and others and AMD are working on being able to run AI inference loads natively on CPUs eventually one day. If they can do that, then a huge portion of their user base is just going to be there strictly for UX purposes. And UX is user experience. I've been using that term. So user experience is the emotional, you know, how satisfying is it to use this product? So if we have passed the intelligence optimum for, I don't know if it's most users, but m certainly many users, it was enough, <clears throat> excuse me, it was enough users that OpenAI had to immediately roll back out 4.0 for a lot of people. Uh, so that's a, that's a pretty big user protest. Now, all that being said is in the investment level in AI is still going up. And you might say, okay, well, investment alone doesn't prove that we're not in a bubble. And that is true because, uh, you know, a bubble by definition means people are speculating, means that they're investing. If you just look at stock prices, yes, it definitely looks like that we're in an AI bubble. You look at Tesla going up, you look at XAI going up, and I don't know what the prices are. You look at NVIDIA going up, all of the Magnificent Seven and every big tech company in AI, their stock prices have done pretty well generally out <clears throat> good grief excuse me it's allergy season so if my throat's a little scratchy i apologize um anyways many ai tech companies are outperforming uh the s p 500 and other indexes so you say okay this really looks like a dot-com bubble however the thing that is not immediately reflected on the stock market is the literally hundreds of billions of dollars being put into ai infrastructure namely chip fabs and data centers. These are, re these are assets that are not captured on, on the stock market. These are CapEx expenses that are going to have to pay off literally over decades because that infrastructure is very expensive. So you have people, whether it's venture capitalists or bankers or whoever else saying, you know what? Even though this frontier data center, this frontier hardware is gonna cost tens of billions of dollars and collectively they're spending hundreds of billions of dollars. I think 137 new data centers are going in this year alone in America. Uh, we are outpacing data center construction uh, by China by a long shot. So that, that'll probably be a, top, a topic for another video. Anyways, 
investment is going up, infrastructure investment is going up. This is one of the things that is structurally different between the AI bubble and the dot-com bubble. Uh, so even if the markets have a cooling off uh, period, the infrastructure is still there. They're not going to just tear down a data center if the AI bubble pops. So keep in mind, there's a difference between the stock market reality and then reality reality. Uh, so that's just that's kind of what I want to put a pin on there. When you look at all the numbers from top to bottom, because you know the stock market, it's easy to just go click on an Nvidia stock graph and say like, look, green number, good number, go up. You know, stock market go brrr, um, or however you say it out loud. Maybe you don't say it out loud. Anyways, so the final synthesis for all this is that uh, we are having a period of product broadening. And so what I mean by that is there's there's more competitors, one, uh, who are releasing a broader array of products, number two, and they're becoming more user-friendly, three. So the use that's what I keep drilling home is now competition comes down to UX. I don't use Grok because it's a terrible UX. Uh, I don't enjoy using Grok. It lies to you. It confabulates. It very obviously has ideological bias, even though Elon Musk keeps saying it has no ideological bias. He literally just chose the opposite ideological bias of other AIs. And that's perfectly fine for some people, um, but it's not steerable. That's one of the worst things is you can't give it your values. You can't say, the, this is the epistemic framework that I want you to use. It uses Elon Musk's version of truth-seeking, which is not truth-seeking in the least. Uh, GPT-5 is far better at truth-seeking. O3 was better at truth-seeking. Um, so that's one of the primary things. And then on a larger perspective, uh, GPT is a GPT. And what I mean by this is generative pre-trained transformers are a general purpose technology. So general purpose technology is a very specific term, meaning that it is pervasive. I've got my notes down here, so if I'm not looking at the camera, I apologize. It's a pervasive technology, meaning it's everywhere. It improves over time. Yes, that's what we're that's what we're all banking on is that it continues to improve. Number three, it, it spawns complementary innovations. So like things like RAG and everything else that's downstream that is relying on generative technology right now. And then it transforms multiple sectors. Also true. Uh, everything from coding to medicine uh, to law. Generative AI is a general purpose technology. Uh, and so that means that what we're seeing is this is a secular trend. So a secular trend means that it, that it is a long-term structural and irreversible change to the economic and business landscape. Meaning, yes, you're going to have business cycles, you're going to have hype cycles, but in the grand scheme of things, this is a permanent change to the way that we do business as usual. That is long story short. So whether or not we're in a short-term bubble, whether or not we're chip constrained, the the game itself has changed. That is the primary point is that the game itself has fundamentally changed around generative AI. So with all that being said, thank you for watching. I hope you like this video. Give me some feedback on structure. I had an outline this time rather than a script. Um, and let me know how the editing goes and the cameras and lights and stuff. Also, uh, please check out my link tree. I've got everything on there that I offer. Um, I've also rebranded another one of my other channels, so I'm going to move all of my post-labor economics stuff over to that channel. Um, so if you're just here for post-labor economics, that'll be over there. Um, I've got my Patreon. I've got my two uh, learning communities. So I've got a burnout community. And then I've also got New Era Pathfinders, which is uh, basically if you're interested in adapting your life or your business to these changes, that's what that, that platform is for. I also offer one-on-one -on -one consultations. All of that is available on my link tree. Go check it out. And another thing that's coming soon is I'll be having my own training courses over on First Movers. That's the platform that uh, Julia McCoy and I have been working on. So that's it for today. Take care, and I'll see you all next time. Have a good one.